Uh, so thanks for the introduction, um, or the invitation, I should say, to come and speak to you. Um, my name is John Orr. I'm a professor of structural engineering at the University of Cambridge. And if you were very, pay very much paying attention to the slides earlier, you would have seen that I gave some in-person talks on this topic in uh, January of this year. So I'm very happy to be back and hopefully speaking to a, a new group of people. Um, it's a series of lectures I've been doing around the world talking about low carbon design, zero carbon and energy and construction. So what I'll try and do is keep relatively brief. I mean, it'll probably be 40 minutes and then we'll have some time at the end to talk about your reflections on what I've said, you know, what the context is in your particular area of work and how that might differ from what I'm talking about. Um, so I very much welcome your thoughts on, on what I'm talking about. I like to start my talks with a photograph of where uh, my office is here in Cambridge. This is first court of Magdalen College. Uh, it's built between 1470 and 1585 and in continuous use ever since then. Uh, I put it up for a few reasons. First, it's you know, a particularly beautiful part of the world. I'm very lucky to work here. Um, but perhaps more importantly, it's been in use for 550 years. And you could say that's because it's a very beautiful building. But that longevity tells us something about what we should be thinking about for new buildings and retention and extension of life of what we already have so that achieving something long lasting which is in my mind a very good thing for carbon emissions and climate emergency um, with the efficient use of materials could be achieved by following what i call my mantra or my sort of design philosophy which is the right material in the right place at the right time and we can add to this, and perhaps not forget, um, work by people like Vitruvius. So let's look to the past as well for our inspiration, who said, with reference to buildings, he said, all these must be built with due reference to durability, convenience and beauty. Alternative translations include stability, utility and beauty. So it depends how you translate the Latin. But those two things put together tell us a lot about efficiency. So if efficiency can be achieved with the right material in the right place at the right time, we can ask ourselves, what material should we use when and where? So the purpose of this talk is really to go through some findings from uh, a project called Minimizing Energy and Construction or MICON for short. And as I said just a moment ago, really to get your thoughts on how the findings that we, we had on our survey and, and the initial research might be different in your own context. I'm very interested to hear your thoughts at the end. So brief agenda, I'll give you some context, um, talk about the survey, some analysis of it, and sort of a meandering discussion around some of the points, and then of course Q&A at the end. Um, I don't want to dwell too much on climate change and climate emergency. I just show one slide, which is CO2 emissions from 1970 to 2020, ever increasing. And then I think it was in 2021 or 2020, when the IPCC released their pathways for um, giving us a chance to get to one and a half degrees warming. Um, the, the two points I like to point to, to show here are we've all been working on this upslope. So all that we really know is ever increasing CO2 emissions. And suddenly after 2020, we're being asked to go down this massive drop in CO2 emissions. That's a huge change. And sometimes people get very um, negative about climate change and worried and anxious and I try and spin it a slightly different way and say it's a very positive thing uh, that sounds a strange thing to say it view it as a positive change so an interesting exciting time for structural engineering to do something different okay so that down slope which I often liken to jumping off of a ski slope if any of you ski rapid change continuous change is exciting on climate change it's important just to say that it's what we call a super wicked problem and that means time is of the essence i.e we need to do something now the people who created the problem are also trying to solve it that's me and you there is no central authority to solve the problem for us there's no one world government that will sort this out for us and perhaps most importantly and particularly relevant to materials is we as humans exhibit something called irrational discounting that pushes our responses into the future. We say, oh, some technology will come along in 10 years time and save us. And carbon capture is kind of one of those technologies. Another analogy would be, I'll start 
I'll start doing exercise tomorrow or I'll give up smoking tomorrow. It's easy to do that tomorrow. Uh, it's much more difficult to do it today. So when we talk about buildings and infrastructure, um, well, particularly buildings, we divide that whole life carbon into operational carbon and body carbon. I'm sure you have seen this before. If we went back 40, 50 years, we would see the operational carbon is dominant in that whole life carbon pie chart on the screen. Now, in the European Union, we have very strict requirements on energy consumption. So that pie is getting smaller. And at the same time, the split between operational and embodied is changing so that now in a net zero operational energy building, all of our carbon is coming really from the materials. And that's sort of why I say it's an exciting time for structure engineers, because it's the materials that we have our grubby mitts on. That's what we control. We say how much concrete, how much steel, and that's where the carbon footprint is coming from. As a sort of simple, two simple examples, this was a tall building in London. I think it's the cheese grater, but um, you know, tall office building. 79% uh, of that carbon is coming from substructure, superstructure. And then another study, which was across a, a, a sort of averaging across lots of schemes was, you know, similar 70% of the carbon is from substructure, superstructure, which is what we design. Um, when we look at this photograph of Shanghai, or it could be a photo of any city, really, I'd just put Shanghai up here. Of course, there's tons of concrete in, in the photograph. And there is an argument to say, well, we need the material to allow economic growth, to improve the lives of citizens, to have roads, to have hospitals. And of course, that is true. Um, one of the things which is clear about most materials is material consumption is quite well correlated to GDP growth. So as your GDP goes up, your material consumption per capita also goes up. So we have to be mindful of that. But the problem that we have identified and is one that we can deal with right now is when we look at how those materials are used, we find inefficiency. So we find that you could save half the concrete, half the steel, half the timber. You could save 20, 30, 40, 50% of that material. So the overuse or underutilization of construction materials is quite common. And that's something that can be dealt with right now. So those two things are not uh, sort of mutually exclusive. Now, when we talk about carbon, which is kind of what the talk is about, I suppose, and energy and carbon, I like to just put this up to remind ourselves, and I'm sure you've seen a slide like this before, that sustainable uh, design is not just about carbon. It's all of these things on the, on the screen. And sustainable design can include um, health, well-being, gender equality, clean water. Primarily with buildings and infrastructure, we're focusing on 11, 12 and 13, which is sustainable cities and communities and so on. Uh, but it's important to remember that the impact of a design goes beyond just a simple kilograms of carbon per square meter count. Now, we've said, or I've said, that business as usual is kind of incompatible with that downslope of carbon emissions that, that we uh, that we need to achieve. And in my experience, construction can be quite bad at embracing quick change, radical change. But actually, there's, you know, two quotes I've put up here to, to inspire us, perhaps. Uh, the only constant is change is a good one, because things are never static, things are always changing. So we should embrace that. And, and construction sector can embrace that, I believe. And the second one is often in, incorrectly, I believe, attributed to Albert Einstein which is we can't solve problems by using the same kind of thinking we used when we created them, which is the same corollary as that going up, up the carbon emission slope, we need to change how we're doing things to go down it. Uh, and again, that is an exciting time for engineering to change the way you do design, the processes that you follow, <clears throat> and so on. Now, when I give talks, I'm often asked, can we achieve net zero, which is a good question, I suppose. And my answer in the UK, at least, is... Um, uh, a simple one that we have to because it's in our law and ignoring what's recently happened with our prime minister changing some of the commitments the fundamental 2050 target is still there to be net zero by 2050 so that's in the uk of course the state of zero carbon net zero carbon ambitions around the world is different and that's one thing that globally we try and work on is to bring everybody up to the same Point, which means, again, if it's a law, if it's, it gives us a definite point to go to, that's a positive news story in terms of changing our design practice.
One further sort of point that I like to just emphasize at the start is we often talk about reducing our impact. So we talk about using less carbon, using less material, and I've already done that in this talk so far. So we talk about being less bad, so shrinking our footprint, shrinking our impact. And that's one way to think about sustainability for sure. But McDonough and Browngart in their book, The Upcycle, try and reframe it again in a much more positive way by saying, don't think about how much less bad you can be. Think about how your design can be more good. And being more good is a never ending staircase. You can always be better. And, and it, it just gives a much more positive feel to this move towards more sustainable design that you can always improve. Uh, and so I do like that reframing of the problem. Now, what I wanted to spend most of the time talking about is a survey that we ran um, a few years ago now, and the second edition has just closed. Um, but uh, the, the survey is to examine the current culture and practice in structural engineering design as it relates to embodied energy. So the reason for this is, in my own experience, a lot of the challenges we face, and I'd be interested to hear your feedback on this point, a lot of the challenges we face are not particularly technical challenges, they are cultural challenges. So how do you change the culture of an entire sector of a structural engineering, construction, architecture sector to help align the incentives of all of those participants in building a, a, a building to get to low carbon design? So I can't go through the whole uh, survey, but you can find on the MICON website, sort of all the details of the report, the survey responses, and in addition to that, and I'll highlight a few of those as we go through, um, in that report, we identified some key questions that we think we would like help from members of the community to help us answer. So if you want to get involved, please check out the website and you can, of course, contact me by email. Now, the first question um, will help me explain what the survey is like. So the survey questions were mostly what we call Likert scale questions. So you have a scale from strongly disagree to strongly agree, for instance, one to seven, uh, and you answer the question, we collect those data points. So the first question was, maximizing material utilization is a key de design criterion for me. And the important thing in this question is the, fi the final two words, for me. So it's, is it important to the person answering this question? And we found there that 80% of people agree or strongly agree that maximizing material utilization, i.e. being efficient with materials, is a key design criterion. So that's good, that's a positive start, that individually we all want to do the right thing. The next three questions that I'll show looked at some of the drivers behind design. So question eight, and now the scale is from never to always. So question eight asked, my clients or design team normally require me to minimize embodied energy. And here we see 70% of people on the never or not usually side of the scale. So you want to do it yourself, but you're not being asked to do it. That's kind of an interesting uh, starting point. And then question nine, material utilization of a structural design is normally presented to clients. Again, we see 71% of people saying never, not usually. So we don't have to tell people what the utilization of our design is. And then question 11 was, clients normally insist on low carbon structural designs. And similarly, we have that same, probably same group of people saying, no, they don't insist on that, doesn't usually happen. So the evidence we have that buildings are built with poor utilization of materials is showing us that that desire of the individual to do the right thing is sort of overridden by other pressures, um, pressures from design teams, from financial people, uh, the fact that nobody's asking you to do it, so why would you spend your valuable time doing it? All of these kind of things uh, lead us to see why um, material inefficiency is quite common. And one of the key, uh, so key pressures comes from a construction site or the construction site. And that's sort of highlighted in question four, where we asked, an easily constructed structure is more valued by the whole design team than a materially efficient one. And this again is strongly disagree to strongly agree. And we see that 80% of people agree or strongly agree with that, that ease of construction is more valuable to my colleagues and my client than material efficiency. 
Question six was the potential for construction errors influences sizing decisions. And there we see 60% of people agreeing with that or strongly agreeing. And then question seven, I think, was the most strongly um, uh, answered question of the whole lot, which was, I simplify my structural designs to improve constructability. 95% of people saying, I simplify my design to make it easier to build. So this ease of construction, the potential for errors, the constructability argument, you can see, um, perhaps you agree with this, that that's a good reason to, to, to um, change designs and actually it's more important than material efficiency. So you, you may well agree or disagree with that, but that's quite clear evidence from the survey that that individual desire to be material efficient is, is overridden by what if they make a mistake on site or having beams of different sizes is too complicated, we shouldn't do that. It's kind of an interesting relationship between the construction site and the design. Um, and I understand where people are coming from. But one of the challenges in this is, despite all of that emphasis on constructability and uh, worrying about construction, when we look at the UK construction sector, and this is only a pie chart for the UK, it's work done by uh, a group called the Get It Right Initiative, which was led by Expedition Engineering. They found that... 21% of costs in UK construction were due to error. So somehow that perception of improving constructability isn't translating into constructability because we're still making errors on the construction site. And that 20% error in cost is important for people who worry about money, which is everyone. But it's also important in terms of material use, because if you're digging up concrete footings because they're in the wrong place and chucking that in the skip, you're wasting the carbon that's associated with that. So that's a kind of a curious um, outcome of the, of, the, of the survey. Now, part of our work in transforming construction is looking at what we can learn from other sectors. So we know in construction in UK and Europe, it's fairly an unproductive uh, sector. So the value added per hour worked hasn't really changed that much or hasn't improved that much for let's say 30 years. And we know that in automotive and aerospace, automation has really helped. Um, and so I'm, I don't propose that construction sites should look like a Tesla factory, but I do think there's something to be learned from the way that cars, airplanes, other components, other widgets have been automated in their production uh, is something we could learn from. And things like mass customization are important. So I just want to take a brief detour to talk about a project that actually is now finished. It was called Automating Concrete Construction, or ACORN, and the website is still available. Um, so in a nutshell, the ACORN project, as it sounds, is automating the concrete construction process. And we immediately focused on moving from thick plates in bending to thin shells working in membrane action for, for reasons of material efficiency. But then you have to think, well, how do you make these shells? How do you do this in an automated fashion? Um, so the ACORN project on this diagram you see here, we start with off-site fabrication of segment segments of concrete shells, which are then transported to site. So the segmentation is really a function of being able to transport them. Um, so you have a nice factory controlled production of a thin shell concrete segment. You take it to site, you assemble it. And then in theory, in the future, you can take that down uh, and reuse it so that you have a sort of more circular approach to um, the design of concrete structures. Now that taking apart and reusing will be happening in maybe 100 or 500 years time. So don't have to worry too much about that. Um, so the concept was quite simple. The difficulty was the segmentation of it. We use things like funicular form finding, parametric design to work out the, the correct form of the shell and then things like the interfaces uh, between the segments and how you connect them. So actually making a segmental concrete shell is um, relatively unusual uh, for perhaps very obvious reasons that you have very quite a lot of difficulties in joining them together. But I just want to show you some of the fabrication that we use. Very simple fabrication setup, which is on the, uh, on the if you can see my mouse on the right hand side is a casting bed and the vertical um, pins that you see allow the height of the bed to be adjusted. Concrete is sprayed over the top. And that means we have this idea of a mass customization. So the video now, you can see the bed shape moving. You can have a mass customization approach because each segment can be slightly different in shape, but cast on the same 
beds. That's some equipment we made uh, at our lab. The robot itself is a bog standard robot out of a car factory. And then we do all sorts of things with Grasshopper and um, uh, our own scripts in terms of the layout and how much material goes where and the thickness. So I just want to show you one video of the process. So we have our, our pin bed mold with a white sheet of fabric over the top. And then the process of making each segment is fairly simple. And hopefully the video comes through on the internet. I'm not sure if it will. If you can see the video, you see now there's short fibers going into the, to the uh, panel. And then it's the layers and the direction is all controlled by the computer and our um, analysis models. And then we put different thicknesses of uh, fiber reinforced concrete where we need it. So this similar idea to what I started with of the right material in the right place at the right time. Um, and then you finish it off with a nice layer of concrete. And this is the final thing. So it's very simple, double curved shell. But the important thing in the, the Acorn project is that the design method, which was all done in Grasshopper and Rhino, so sort of parametric design environment, we started our project very much with an, what we called an end-to-end -end approach. So the design method was informed by what can the robot actually do? And the reason for that is often those two things are disconnected. The construction, the fabrication of something is disconnected from the person who actually designs it, which is kind of what we saw in the Micron survey, that people worry about constructability, perhaps because they're not involved in the construction side at all. So we tried as much as we could to join those two things up. A robot can do certain things, it can't do anything. So you are constrained in your design space by what can the robot actually do. Uh, so we had some development in the pin bed mold, but the, the the orange robot that you can see in that photo, the sort of the, mo the mobile arm has a range of capacity and we had to work within that. Now there is a second step to this, which is thinking, well, what kind of machinery would we design in an ideal world to start making even more efficient structures? But here we were working with what we already had uh, and looking at how the design process can be informed by fabrication. And that's really important, I think, change in the way that we do design and perhaps goes back to some of my favorite designers, engineers, contractors, people like Pierre Luigi Nervi working in Italy in the 1950s and 60s, uh, Eladio Dieste in Uruguay, uh, both of whom were the engineer, the contractor, the architect, all in one. So they understood what they were designing and how to fabricate it. Now, the ACOM project was a little bit of a reaction to some of the automation of construction that we see around the world, which is typically, uh, for concrete anyway, flat panels, biscuits of concrete, certain thicknesses. Um, they could be volumetric, they could be panels. All of them, to me, use a lot of material. So when in the bottom right-hand corner of that slide, you see a building which is almost entirely made up of, let's say, 300 mil thick concrete, which is just not, in my view, the right way to use concrete. Concrete is a high value material. Uh, it has great properties in compression, but to use it as a filler material, I find challenging considering, considering that climate impact that we can't avoid. There's no way to make Portland cement without emitting CO2. So it's that idea of saying, why do we need to make prismatic rectangular panels using very much an inefficient way of, of holding up a building and can we do it in a better way and how do we automate that? And the work of the ACOM project really built on uh, work that was done nearly 10 years ago now in moving from rigid molds that you see on the left to flexible molds that you see on the right hand side and the, the bundle of geotextile that um, my colleague is holding up in that photo is actually the formwork for this beam which is 12 meters long, it's a real beam. We cast it with Lafarge in Canada back in 2011. Um, so it's 12 meters long and it's shaped to optimize the form. And it's really taking that idea of what's where's the right place to put the material and how do you actually make it? And the idea behind fabric formwork is to give you a simple way to hold a fluid material in an unusual shape. And that unusual shape in this case just happens to be uh, an optimized one. So, if we just return then to the uh, the survey, one of the questions that we have with this kind of picture is, does a client want it? Does a local authority want it? How do you convince building control and planning and, and so on? So when we talk about low carbon, it's easy in our lab to get a bit carried away 
But one of the key research questions that came out of the Micron project is aligning incentives. So all the people involved in a project, client, architect, engineer, legislators, contractors, they very much have different incentives. And that makes it very hard to see how you get to a zero carbon design because that's not what everybody is driving to typically. And so we, one of our research questions that we open up to people to give their thoughts on is exactly that. How do you align the incentives? Is it a carrot or is it a stick or is it both? Uh, and related to this is looking at what does actually, what does good look like? What is a benchmark for structural utilization or structural design? Um, and how do you present that information to your clients? Now, this is this idea of benchmarking, of knowing what good looks like is an important one. Um, and the, the, the box plot on the screen here is actually from 2017, but it's just used to highlight a point. This is data from, um, I think it's University of Washington database of carbon per square meter uh, for commercial buildings. There's 514 buildings there. The average is 400 and you've got a huge range from 2,700. The reason I put this up is actually when you dig into data, often you find that the various data points have been measured in different ways. So we're comparing apples and gorillas, I like to call it. So this idea then, this work here led to um, my work with the iStruck T in producing one set of consistent way, one set of consistent methodology to measure the carbon in your designs. And that, that came about in the guide, how to calculate embodied carbon, which is now in its second edition. And if you haven't read it or haven't seen it, then it's freely available. Um, from the iStructy website. And this sets out a method to calculate embodied carbon. It's not necessarily perfect. In fact, it's not perfect. I think that's fair to say. But it's important that we all follow the same method so that clients can compare between people, between bids, and we can compare between our teams and so on. So the principles of the guide are just quickly lay out. First of all, we have to achieve net zero. Of course, that's important. Uh, the infinity sign is there to represent that calculating embodied carbon is to be done on every project you work on, from a loft extension through to a 20-story residential building. Very important, it's always done. The colored circle is the UN SDGs, which we talked about earlier. And this set of scales is there that to, to remind us that the embodied carbon calculation is intended to be used to evaluate your decisions. Embodied carbon as a calculation should be a part of the process of design. It's not something to do at the end when you've finished to say, I've done my design, this is what it is, and now the embodied carbon is 600 kilos per square meter. The intention of it is, as you go through, to keep calculating, to see how you can communicate what that value is and find ways to reduce it. That's the whole point. It's not it's not that there's no point in doing it at the end, but it's more valuable if you can do it all the way through and find the hotspots of carbon and work with your design team to reduce them. And then importantly, doing that internally, you know, talking to your design teams, of course, that's useful. Even more valuable is reporting that information publicly. Now, public, public reporting of carbon data or building data, of course, brings other problems. In the UK, we have something called the Built Environment Carbon Database which will be launching soon if it hasn't already, I forget the exact date, but that is a place where people can submit their carbon calculations. They can say the typology of the building, floor area, carbon count, and it's all done in an anonymized way. And this reporting is important because it allows us to say, you know, what's the current state of play in our sector? What, what have people done to get to very low numbers or what's happening with very high numbers? And you know, are there interesting case studies to pick out from that? Now, briefly, when we talk about embodied carbon, we need to show the uh, life cycle stages. If you follow the, the iStruct T guide, your minimum scope is A1 to A5, so cradle to practical completion. The bulk of the carbon, of course, comes from A1 to A3, cradle to gate. That's where most of it comes at the moment. So that's the minimum scope. Of course, best practice is to, con to consider, excuse me, to consider the whole life cycle A through to D, uh, but minimum scope is A1 to A5. Now, when we after we wrote the first version of how to calculate embodied carbon, we then thought about this idea of benchmarking and what does good look like, which led us to produce a carbon target system called SCORES, um, which kind of builds on 
certainly something we have in Europe, which is energy rating stickers, which, you know, on your fridge, there's a little sticker which says A++ down to G or whatever. I'm sure you have something similar. Uh, so building on that idea, but for buildings, so it's called scores. Again, you can find this online. Um, and so we take the, the carbon count A1 to A5 and the building gets a rating. Now, the important thing about the rating system, as you'll see on the graph, is that it changes over time. So in the graph, you see from 2020 to 2050, the dark black line is the global average target. That's where on average we need to be. And then there's two dotted lines, 40% better and 40% worse than average. This was calibrated at the time with a bunch of data from uh, companies here in the UK. And we have looked back at it only recently and it does seem to be working. But the important thing is over time that target changes. So if you were designing in 2020, you should on average be getting an E to F, so 350 kilos per square meter. By 2035, we need to be down at 120, 100-ish, 100 100-ish kilos per square meter. So that reinforces this previous quote of the only constant is change, that every time you do something, you're going to be improving. And cookie cutter designs of repeating something that was done before isn't going to help you stick onto that black line. And of course, being 40% better is even more um, challenging, but it means that targets change over time, which reflects the importance of that time related nature of embodied carbon. Uh, returning to the survey, we, we talked in the survey a lot about design conditions. And one of the criteria for design, of course, is loading. Um, this, of course, is the Golden Gate Bridge. And if I could see you all, I would ask you to guess what the loading on the bridge is, but I can't see you. So I'll just tell you it's about 2.9 kilos, per, sorry, 2.9 kPa, um, which is probably the highest vertical loading the bridge had ever seen. And in the survey, we tried to examine what people's perception of loading in buildings was. So we asked people to imagine that they were designing a tool building and you know, an office building. And we asked questions on what the characteristic, the average load and the maximum load would be. And the characteristic load people would choose, the median value was three kPa. So that's supposed to be a statistically extreme value. That's what you use in your design if you're following Eurocodes. Um, we also asked, what do they think the average floor load over 60 years would be in this office building? And they said 1.5. And then the maximum in use of 2.5. So it's kind of interesting in many ways. First of all, if you look at the graph that's been building up at the bottom, you see the three um, criteria design average and maximum. It's quite a big range. Uh, one of them possibly is an outlier, but anyway, we include all the data. It's quite a big range. And so for something as simple as an office building, we don't have much consistency amongst people of what, or consensus, I should say, about what the floor loading should be. Now, in use average of 1.5 is equivalent of six 25 kilogram bags of cement per square meter on average on the floor, which feels high to me. But what we found in London particularly is something even more interesting, which is our design codes say uh, you should design for between two and three kPa. This is actually about to change to just being three kPa. The design code says that. London offices tend to be designed to three to five, so even higher. Um, and then surveys of floor loading going back a long time show that the loading is probably a tenth of what was designed for. So there's this disconnect between uh, why we what we're designing for and what we need. Um, and it's a problem that's been around for a while. In 1925, somebody called Wilson was saying that live loads had scant scientific basis. And then more recently in 2014, um, the BCO is the British Council for Offices, so the people who do the spec sheets basically, uh, were saying that we use higher loading in the UK because of a perception that this gives a degree of flexibility. So this is important. Again, it's a, it's a cultural thing, not a technical thing. A perception of flexibility could be important. And it's almost like trump cards. If you're looking at two offices and one has a live load capacity of two kPa and the other one has six, somehow that feels like the six is better. Of course, that doesn't make much sense if you know what the floor loading is uh, really talking about. So that perception of flexibility is something we need to challenge. And if I just give you an example, what we looked at the design, the imaginary design of a 30,000 square meter, 16 story building. And we said, what does each discipline 
imagine is going on in terms of people in the building. So if you're the ventilation engineer, you size all the ducts for about one person per 10 square meters, so 3,000 people. If you're planning the desks, it might be 3,700. If you're the fire engineer, you're you're slightly more importantly looking at things like escape routes and the widths of stairs, so possibly seven and a half thousand people. I hope you can see where this is going. If you're the structural engineer, you're looking at 85,000 people in the building. I've chosen an extreme version of that. There's a few options down the bottom. It might be 40,000 if you're looking at um, SLS, for example. But it's order of magnitude different. And it's a question of, of what really is going on and what we really mean by reliability and safety if we're so far away from what, what's going on in real life. And just to give you a sense of what that looks like, I've got a video of what does loading actually look like. If you get up to 5.6, it's people squashed in like sardines. It's more loading than you find on the London tube train at rush hour, um, which we don't find often in an office building. The final thing on codes is that people often think design codes and partial factors are based on probabilistic methods. Um, unfortunately, in the Euro codes, things like partial factors and psi factors are quite openly, we, we are told, that they are calibrated on the basis of a long experience of building tradition. So there's an opportunity here to say, uh, well, what should we really be doing and avoiding this ratchet effect of, you know, changing numbers vaguely over time based on what committees think rather than what's really going on. Uh, there's lots more information on the MyCon website on this if you wish to find out. But one thing this then leads us into is saying, well, can we measure buildings? Can we look at loading? Can we look at performance in a more consistent way? And then you get into all sorts of things about data and um, big data and what that really means. Um, I'll give you one example of where this can go wrong is Sticking strain gauges on a building in the effort, let's say it's a steel frame building for the sake of argument, steel frame building, you put strain gauges everywhere to measure strains with the hope that you'll look at what the loading might be. Um, let's say it was designed for 4 kPa. What you might find is you've instrumented uh, the building and really all you have is a thermometer because the change in loading over time from people is so tiny, but the thermal effects are much bigger. So you actually, all you see is a diurnal change in temperature, which is an expensive way to measure temperature. So measuring buildings is a whole field of, of difficulty. Um, and it's not as easy as just sticking sensors everywhere. Uh, returning to our survey, I'm just conscious of the time. So returning to our survey, we also looked at the serviceability limit state. So we asked, in your experience, how often does serviceability govern the size or structural elements this is an important point governing the size and we found 90 percent of people were saying serviceability limit state is always or usually governing the sizing of structural elements which is kind of interesting if we think about what is sls versus uls so ultimate versus serviceability and why are we allowing things like deflection or vibration to dominate the material use in a building um and people like my colleague chris wise would say when you think about SLS, then have the phrase enough is enough. So how much serviceability do you really need? And in some situations, flat slabs, you know, span over 240 is appropriate, but in others it's not. And really thinking what the impact of your limits are in terms of material consumption is important. And that takes us back to embedding in your design process calculations of embodied carbon so that you know the impact of these different design decisions. Related to serviceability, we asked uh, in the survey, how frequently would you be comfortable with allowing those SLS limits to be exceeded in an office building through its lifetime? So if you follow a Eurocode, you are not allowed to have them be exceeded, first of all. So it's interesting what the responses were. Uh, for deflections, we found 10% of people saying they're happy for that to be exceeded the majority of the time, 20% saying never. That's quite an interesting split. Vibrations, people, 28% of people happy for that to be exceeded a few minutes per day. Uh, cracking was perhaps more extreme with 40% of people saying never exceeded. So this idea that we might be more flexible in our you know, approach to SLS limits takes us then into the realms of thinking about uh, traffic light systems in buildings. So you could monitor what's going on. You can control the flow of people if the deflection is getting too high in some places. 
there's lots of opportunity there or really more importantly thinking what are the limits and what should be really designed for we also looked at a whole bunch of uh, uh, steel beams in real buildings this was analyzed by um, a colleague of mine called Cyril Dunant and he looked at 3,600 beams in real buildings and what you see in the graph is um, a utilization ratio on the horizontal axis from zero to one and then the percentage of the mass of the building that's in that um, histogram bin on the vertical axis. So the first thing to note is that pretty much people would work to 80% utilization. And sometimes when we talk to designers, we find that you can, you know, you can set targets in your software, right? So if you start with a target of 80%, then probably you're going to end up with that. Um, so the open question of why not take something to 100% utilization that's completely allowed within the euro codes but interestingly again when we look at why um, or how those members are being governed 60 percent of them are governed at the serviceability limit state so again we have this question of well, what limit should we really be using um, particularly with vibrations vibrations is one which is often analyzed poorly and if that's being governing the material use then it's really an opportunity to to think about how you do your vibration analysis and then we thought about well, what should that graph really look like would we like buildings where the vast majority of the mass is working at 100 percent utilization possibly bending um, and then what does that mean in terms of the structural design i don't think this would ever be achieved because we always need some i don't know trimmer beams or little bits doing not very much but important for the way you build the structure so we can accept some components working at low utilization of course but the other important thing about utilization is it tells only part of the story. Um, so a high utilization ratio needs to be combined with measuring how many kilograms of steel or concrete that you're using. The simplest example is to imagine an I-beam bending about its minor axis. If you take that to 100% utilization, you've got high utilization, but you're using the beam in a fairly silly way and you should turn it onto its major axis and then utilization would be much lower. So mass and utilization are important to be considered in design. Um, one of the last questions I'll show you is uh, number 23. You were asked to design the floor plate in a multi-story building. And the question is, which of the following has the biggest influence on your design? So 30% of people saying ease of construction. So that's the biggest influence. 54% saying cost to the client. And then there are two others, which I forget at the moment, but 20% people saying material consumption. So there's this slightly interesting split between what is the biggest influence. But one thing we try to suggest through the MyCon project is to think about who is your client. Uh, your client, in the responses to this question, people are obviously thinking about the person paying the bills. But another way to think about this is society or the planet than which your building or asset is uh, impacting. And the biggest influence of a design might be those indirect impacts. Of course, climate change is one, but if you've got inefficient use of concrete and you've got 50% too many cement mixers going through Beijing, then there's more diesel fumes, there's more cyclists being hit by trucks. So all those externalities that are important to think about um, and an absence, absence sorry, of sustainable thinking, you know, not just material use, but other other things is uh, something which is missing at the moment. Um, and possibly the most common one is that indirect health impact um, of, of those trucks and the, the activities of construction. So just as a reminder, then, this is the pathway that we have. Um, and it's quite challenging to get there. One of the things which is interesting is to look at that budget that the IPCC gave us, 580 gigatons, and see uh, how much construction can you actually do in that budget, and then think about all the other things that people want to do with that budget, and then you realize how constrained it would be. Um, and so the, the question then becomes, what do those buildings, those net zero buildings actually look like? And I don't think there's a, an easy answer, um, but it's certainly a an interesting position to be in where we can say as designers, there's lots of things we can try and that's kind of um, the important message. Um, I've got two more slides or a few more slides, maybe two or three. Um, I just wanted to highlight a book that we wrote back in 2021 now called Design for Zero, which goes into um, 
pathways to reduce carbon in design. It's again, I struck tea publication. Um, and there's in that book, we set out five things that everybody can do today. So I thought I would finish with some positive things that you can do. Uh, the first is more philosophical, I suppose, make carbon as important as safety in your calculations. So you take ownership for carbon, you take ownership for safety, make them the equal pegging. Uh, sometimes that's a controversial statement. So I'd be interested to know if you agree. Uh, interrogate and challenge every brief. You know, do you really need to build anything? Can you work with your clients to reduce the scale of construction? Keeping stuff in use for longer. Avoiding demolition and moving more to deconstruction if you have to. Reusing everything. And when you're in detailed design, to think about what is the lowest carbon material technology and product that you have available to you? So what's your supply chain? What's available and how can you use it in your project? And aim then to leave a positive impact beyond just zero carbon in the work that you do. Okay. Uh, leave my uh, email address on the screen. So please feel free to get in touch if you have questions. There's the MyCon website and my own website. Uh, so thanks for listening and happy to answer any questions.